Welcome back to the Messy Reformation. My name's Jason Rice. I'm the lead pastor at Faith Community CRC in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. My co-host is Willie Cronkey. He's a member at Pease CRC in Pease, Minnesota. We're just a couple of guys who love the Christian Reformed Church and want to see Reformation happen in our denomination. But we realize that whenever Reformation happens in the history of the church, things get messy. And after this past synod, and looking forward to this next synod, things are really starting to get messy in the Christian Reformed Church. So we're taking the opportunity to have conversations with pastors throughout the Christian Reformed Church to find out what's going on in our denomination, but also to talk about what Reformation might look like. If you haven't already, take a moment, click subscribe so you don't miss any of our upcoming content. We're dropping episodes every single Sunday evening. We also want to say thank you to everyone who sponsored us on Patreon We're slowly making our way to our modest goal of 20 sponsors at $5 a month. So if you appreciate what we're doing and want to help us continue to put out content, head on over to patreon.com slash the messy reformation. You can also support us for free by sharing our content. I'm a terrible self-marketer and everyone knows that now, so I need your help. If you know of anyone who would benefit from listening to this content, let them know about the messy reformation. With all of that said, we're going to get to this week's episode, which is part two of Willie and I's conversation about current events in the Christian Reformed Church. I think um, I think there's one really telling statement in here, and this is where where it kind of jumped out at me. One, the statement is. Um, we are not focused on being either for or against any particular, they say group, um, but but really, I, I know they're being intentional about their language. They're trying to say we're not for or against any group, but the reality is our groups are, these groups, these lines that are forming within the Christian Reformed Church are based around ideologies. That's right. Or understandings or theologies, whatever. Um, and so what they're saying is we're not either for or against either one of these positions. And uh, if you're not for or against anything, then what are you? That's right. You're lukewarm. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're neither hot nor cold. Um, and, and Jesus wants to do what? Vomit them. Yeah. And, and and what's telling to me is that for one, this has been this has been the history of the Christian Reformed Church. Not wanting to be for, I mean, not 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 long term history. Um, I can I can grant that the CRC has a history of making big issues out of small things, um, but that's not now, and that hasn't been for like forty years. Um, for the last 40 years, the CRC has been known for being neither for nor against anything mm-hmm. as a whole. Now, more recently, we're known outside of the Christian Reformed Church. We're known for being for, you know, Black Lives Matter and all of that, because that's what our publications keep throwing out there all the time. But but really, when it comes down to certain issues like this, we, we just kind of try to find this middle way. And I was just listening to um a Paul Vanderclay um episode where he was he was with the reformed podmatics guys. I'm not done with the whole interview yet, but but even in that episode, Paul says, you know, the Christian Reformed Church has always been a, a, a church of the middle. Right. Like, or a church of to use the more recent controversial language, a church of the third way. Right. We're, we're a third way church. We we're neither, we're neither Democrats nor Republicans. We're, we're, we're some in the middle. We're, we're neither egalitarian or complementarian. We're just kind of somewhere in the middle. We're neither this nor that we're somewhere in the middle. And, and we've always kind of tried to take that. We've been taking this place where we think that the third way is always the best way in everything. And that's just, not right. That's that's not that's so unbiblical. And 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 what what really stands out for me is if you don't stand for something, it, for me, and this is where I start to get wound up is if you don't stand for something that shows that you don't really love anything. Because mm-hmm. in order for you to truly love something, to really really love something, 
that means by necess by, that means necessarily mm-hmm. that you also hate anything that will hinder or attack or hurt this thing that you love. And so if you're going to be wishy-washy in the middle and stand for nothing, that means you actually aren't loving. And for us who can get wound up about certain things, um, we are wound up about things because we truly love something. And, and we're, we're frustrated, we're angry, we're fighting against all of these things that are attacking the thing that we love. And for us, really, I know people would accuse us of loving maybe some wrong things, but but really for us, we're we're loving the glory and honor of God and his word and what he's revealed to us. And we think he's clearly revealed these things in his word. And so anything that's coming against that, we think is dishonoring God, dishonoring his word. And then on top of that, because you're dishonoring God, because you're dishonoring his word, then you're destroying people. And we love people and we think what you're doing is hurting people. And so that's why we respond the way we do, because we actually love. But if you stand in the middle, neither for nor against anything, you have no real love. That's right. And it's, it's interesting, Jason, the language that you just used uh, is the exact same language that they would use against us. Uh, They would say, we really love people, and we believe that you are doing damage to them. And my whole point in this is, yes, that's correct. We are accusing each other of the same accusations. There is a gulf fixed between these two camps. And that is my whole assertion in denouncing this third way. Uh, Not only does it not work, it can not work. Not only do I think it is not feasible. I don't even think it's possible ideologically to stand in the middle. Um, I remember what, who was it? Winston Churchill said, you know, having enemies means you stood, you stood for something. (laughs) Uh, And we've been very afraid to stand for anything. Um, And that's why I was very encouraged by the stand that we took at Synod this year. And I do think that there are those um, probably even on the left, who are progressives or revisionists, whatever we want to call them, who would actually see the third way and say, actually, we disagree with that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think as long as we can stay charitable enough to understand, we don't agree here and we never will agree. And this whole third way, agree to disagree, it's, I believe it is a non starter. I believe it's not intellectually, theologically, or evangelistically honest in any sense of the way. And I don't think we, we should have anything to do with it. I think scripture is very clear. Um, there are two kinds of people, the kind that go to heaven, the kind that go to hell, or the way Paul calls it, those who are saved and those who are perishing. It's descriptive of our life right now. And I think going forward, it's only going to be better if we define our terms with one another and, and come to a reality of the situation we're in. Yeah. So no, I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole, but I'll just point out. So we need clarity, Willie. Oh, that's right. We need, (laughs) we need clarity and you, and you're the guy for that, aren't you? No, Um, (laughs) no, but here's the, I mean, defining terms is a big deal. Like they, there's a lot of words that are used in, in that, what I just read that, that need to be defined. That's right. Right. Like if we are a mission focused, Mm -hmm. what, what is the mission that we're focused on then? If we if we disagree fundamentally on what is sin and what is not sin, what needs to be repented of and what needs to be embraced, if we disagree fundamentally on that, how can we be in mission together, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, unless mission is something else. Like maybe they think, you know, it's it's possible that they've got this kind of social gospel going on, right? That Kyperianism can and so we're we're gonna join together and 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 do what? reform our communities, but not share the gospel with them. Well, that's not, for one, that's not Kyperianism, truly. Right. That's right. And, uh, and I don't want anything to do with that either. So I don't want to join you on that mission. We don't have unity over what mission is. They say we want to have unity over our baptismally based identity. Right. What does that mean? 
I mean, as far as I read scripture, your baptismal identity is you've died in Christ. Now you're united with him in baptism. (laughs) What does it mean to die in Christ? Oh, we disagree on that. And we disagree on what our baptismal identity is and what's included in what dies and what rises again. So we can't unite around that either. Um, And so you can use all of these these terms, um, but it's not going to get us anywhere, right? Because there is no, we're just trying, they're, they're using words like unity when they don't know what unity is. They're using, they're using terms like baptismal identity, missional unity, all of these things. And, and we don't agree on that either as a denomination. And um, it, it reminded me of this quote I saw from R.C. Sproul this week. This will really, he says, most heretics try to mask their heresy by using orthodox language to convey it. That's right. And that's what we're seeing. And R.C. Sproul was the man, I mean, I didn't, I didn't meet him personally, but I've listened to him, read his books, and he was the one who said, you need to keep asking the question, what do you mean by the words that you're saying? Sure, you say Jesus Christ is Lord. Great. What does that mean? What does it mean for him to be Lord? Um, and these are the questions we really need to start asking. I'm I'm in the middle of a project. It's taking me a lot longer than I was wanting. Um, but I'm working through a bunch of the arguments that have been made in the Christian Reformed Church right now for an affirming position on sexuality. So GRE, you know, they've already put out their own affirming sexuality report. It's all public online. It's 140 pages, I think. And you can read through all of the arguments that they're making for that. And then uh, there's Pastor Woody from Jubilee Fellowship, Jubilee CRC, who's, you know, who's on video online baptizing the the, the so-called child of a so-called gay couple. Um, and he's got a video series of him explaining his reasons why. And, uh, and then people made arguments from the floor of Synod. And so I've been trying to kind of take all of these arguments, boil them down, and then basically turn it into a short series of blog posts. So pay attention for it. I'm hoping I'll get it done. Going through Machen's, J. Gresham Machen's care, uh, categories of the Bible. What do, we, what do we believe according to the Bible? Well, it's very clear that, that the affirming camp does not, they say that we believe in the authority of God's word. And I think they say that with honesty. But then when you listen to them, uh, Pastor Woody, in his video series, says, well, we believe in God's word as an authority, kind of like an older brother, is the exact words that he used. Well, that's not the kind of authority that we're talking about when we say we believe the Bible's authoritative. Mm-hmm. So we disagree on that. We disagree on the Bible. We disagree on who Jesus is. Did Jesus condemn homosexuality or not? They would say no. We would say yes. How are we saved by turning from our sin or, and, and can you say that I believe, you know, that there's a big question out there amongst progressives. They say, well, all these people we know that are living in same sex relationships, they say they believe in Jesus. So how can we deny this from them? Well, what does it mean to truly believe in Jesus Christ? What does faith mean? Does it mean you deny yourself? Does it mean you take up your cross? Does it mean you turn away from your natural desires? Does it, does it, what does it mean? We disagree on that. What does it mean to be part of the church? We disagree on that. They say unity, 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 unity around what? Our Dutch identity? Unity around like location? You, I mean, based on their definition of unity, we could be united with the the Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, the, the the ELCA, the PCUSA, the Methodist Church, we could just join together and pool our resources and not agree on anything. Mm-hmm. So go do that. See how that works out for you. It's not going to work. And so we disagree on what the church is fundamentally. We disagree on the Bible. We disagree on Jesus. We disagree on salvation. We disagree on the church. And our and theology proper, our doctrine of God. Yeah. I, I, I would submit that to you as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, is our God only love? 
Uh, or, or is our God, as Hebrew says, a consuming fire? It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Yeah. I, I think they have lost a fundamental identity, not just of their anthropology, but of theology proper, who God is. Yeah, well, they've denied the simplicity of God. That's right. right. Which, which means, uh, for those listening who don't know what the simplicity of God is, doesn't mean that God's simple to understand, but it's a doctrine that teaches that all of God, God holds all of his attributes fully all the time. So he's not just a little bit of love and a little bit of wrath or, and a little bit of omniscience and a little bit. Uh, he's all of those all of the time. And so you cannot just say God is love, right? That's that's what was written by our congregational ministry directors, right? Mark Stevenson wrote it. It was affirmed by our congregational ministry leaders that the fundamental question we need to answer when talking to our our homosexual people is, we need to tell them God is love. No, God is love. He's also wrathful. He, I mean, he's all, he's lots of things. He's wise, he's private, you know, he's sovereign. He's, he's all of these things all the time. We don't just get to take one that makes us feel warm and fuzzy and hold it up and say, well, this is our God. Because guess what happens when you lose the simplicity of God? You have crafted a God in your own image. Like, I don't like the wrath thing. We're going to take that one out. We're going to, we don't like this aspect of God. We're going to take that one out. And we're just going to kind of craft and mold this God to become who we want him to be. And then we'll worship him. Then it's not God, not the true God. It's some false idol that you've created that you're worshiping. Um, but you're not worshiping the true God at that point. And so, yeah, we've, we're so divided on these things. We, we are, it is not the same religion. And I know that bothers people so much, but, but I'm tired of the BS as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I'm tired of trying to be nice and lying. Like we can't, that's also a commandment. It's just as bad for us to lie. Just as bad. It's also a sin to lie. Right. It's, it's not good to lie. If that means you're being nice. You, we're, we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to acknowledge reality. And the reality is we're, we're two separate religions. The division is here. And, and uh, it's the same thing with that happened at the Reformation, right? I mean, you and I have had that conversation a whole bunch of times. Like, did the Reformation cause division? No. The division was there. It had been there. It had been raging for years. They had been killing people talking about Reformation for 100 years before the Reformation happened. Mm -hmm. The church was divided. It was some kind of false unity from the outside people thought maybe. I don't even know if people actually thought there was unity there. I think people saw all of the division going on in the Catholic church. And when the reformation came, all it did was reveal the division that was already there. And that's what's happening in the CRC right now too. The division was there. Nobody's, we're not necessarily causing it. The division has happened. Um, and we're just trying to shed light on it and say, this is here. Now let's pick the, the right path, uh, the path that sticks with, with our God and, and his word and, and how he's taught us how to live and, and act in this world. That's right. And uh, along with all these things, I've, I've, I've said this for a while now. I think there is a misunderstanding as far as, you know, you know, sola scriptura, uh, you know, uh, the scriptures, the sole infallible rule of faith and life for the church. Um I, I think everybody in the revisionist camp would say, well, we do believe um, in sola scriptura. They would say, we believe in the authority of scripture. And I would say, that's right. Maybe. Do you believe in the sufficiency of scripture? I think that's where some of this divide is too. Or do you need emotional appeals, alternative testimonies, extra biblical evidence to support your case? Uh I think there is a fundamental denial here, not of the authority of Scripture, not the infallibility of Scripture, although in some cases that is, but the sufficiency of Scripture. And I think we, as Orthodox believers who do hold the Sola Scriptura, ought to be speaking very clearly, saying, no, this is the infallible rule of faith and life for the church, and it reveals to us uh, everything we need to know about matters of salvation, of which this is one. 
This is a salvation issue. This is a gospel issue. And as I've said, to to sacrifice uh, to sacrifice our uh, our positions to make these compromises is to sacrifice the gospel. Now, I just need to ask the question: Are we prepared to do that? Uh, I'm most certainly not. <laughs> No. And let's, I want to be honest here and I wish I could get this message out to the entire Christian reformed church. Cause I want to be clear. I, I'm, I'm like, I feel very strongly that if this better together third way approach, if, if they get their way, if we come up to send 2023 and we backtrack on what we've done, um, the Christian Reformed Church will die. It will be dead within five years because it will hemorrhage so many conservative churches that will leave. They're done. We're not going to fight this battle anymore if, the, if it backtracks. We'll just turn the, turn the CRC over and let it die. We're done. And so, like, we cannot backtrack right now. And, and I, I really want to just encourage, and I know conservative churches have a tendency to just get tired and fed up with all of the the politics going on and all of the the chaos going on in our denomination. I want to just keep encouraging any conservative church in the CRC, get involved in this and speak. Because that's really the beauty of what just happened in 2022 was the churches, the conservative churches in the Christian Reformed Church rose up, sent delegates and said, no, this is who we are as a church. This is where we're standing. We're not moving on this. And let me tell you, this coming synod is going to be harder, way harder. And so churches need to rise up again and make sure they're sending solid delegates who are ready to stand firm and say, no, this is where we're at. And, uh, and I just keep getting confirmed more and more and more as I, you know, we've been, we've been doing this podcast for two years, over two years now. We've interviewed, I don't know how many different pastors and Because we've interviewed all these pastors, we have way more connections all throughout the Christian Reformed Church right now. And I'm even more convinced that 70 to 75% of this denomination has an orthodox understanding of sexuality. Um, And so if we backtrack on it because somebody comes in and out politicizes us and, you know, makes some political move and and gets us to backtrack or does that, I would bet 50% of the churches will leave at least 25% will stay even though they're orthodox because there's some connection there, but I bet we'll lose 50% of our churches like this and the denomination will be toast at that point. So we need to fight for the denomination again. And so if, you know, anybody listening to this podcast, um, I thank you. We're glad that you're listening to us, but we want to encourage you too to like help kind of share some of this stuff with other people. We're not doing, we're not making any money off of this. Um, We're not trying to make a name for ourselves. We're just trying to get information out to churches and get people involved and help them understand what's going on in the Christian Reformed Church and help kind of get people ready to to keep our denomination in in the path it needs to go. So try to share this with some other churches in your classes and kind of help spread the message so that we can continue to stand firm as a denomination. Wait a minute. We're not making money on this. I'm well, shooting mine from my, I'm shooting mine, my podcast from my Rolls Royce. I don't know about you. <laughs> yeah. Having, having a podcast with the niche of conservative CRC people, <laughs> it's not like a money-making scheme here. Right. Um, and so, but yeah, we're, and this is, we just, we're relying on, on our listeners and this kind of, there's a grassroots movement happening in the CRC. I really think that this, the just the kind of the way that our podcast has kind of taken off and the number of people that are listening to it now has just proven to me that there's this kind of revival starting to happen in the CRC. And so even with like, I'm not actually that worried about this better together third way group. Maybe I should be. I know some people were really nervous about it and they're thinking like some of the moderates are going to be tempted to go that way. That's actually not the feeling I'm getting as I'm talking to people and, uh, and listening to the conversations that were happening on the floor of Synod, I really think the moderates of the Christian Reformed Church, they're not budging on this either. They're uncomfortable about it. They don't want to have to make this hard decision, but they realize too, there's no third way here. There's no third way. And, uh, 
And so we just have to make the hard call and have the tough conversation and then trust our God in the midst of that, because um, he's always going to be faithful, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And uh, kind of my thoughts right now, Jason, um, as we're, I don't know where we're at for time, but as we look toward the end here um, at some point, I, I normally ask the question about going forward. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm going to take it in a little bit different direction. It is a going forward question, but how do you think we could better prepare and better serve um, those of us who are Orthodox, who maybe are going to Synod this year that we know about? And how could we just encourage anybody, whether their classes have decided their delegations or whether only the Lord in his knowledge knows that right now? Um, yeah. and, you know, we were both there at Synod 2022. Um, I was also at Synod 19 prior to that. Um, so what do you think we could say to our listeners who are either pastors, elders, deacons, or otherwise who might attend this upcoming Synod? Yeah. Well, my first thing I would, I would tell you is, you know, right now is when all of the classes are really starting to ramp up and the classes are starting to choose their delegates for Synod. And so I know a number of classes have already done that. They've already chosen their their delegates coming up for synod, but most are going to be happening over the month of February. And so if you're listening to this podcast and you're an elder or deacon or a pastor, whether you think you're qualified to speak or not, I would encourage you put your name forward to be a delegate. Um, go to synod, be ready to be ready to stand firm. And, and the reality is you don't have to get up and speak from the floor or anything. You have to, show up, know God's word, know where God's calling us to go as a denomination, and then vote accordingly and talk about it. Um, you don't have to stand up and make a big show of anything. You just have to be show up and be faithful. And that's a huge thing. So don't be intimidated by it. I know a number of people are intimidated by the whole process. And um, I just encourage you to go and put your name up because that's really what we need first is we need to get we need to make sure our church, and I'm not trying to, you know, some people have tried to accuse the Abide Project, and I guess not me, but I'm associated with the Abide Project, and they've tried to accuse us of trying to, like, manufacture the the delegation, which is totally impossible, by the way, um, and we're not doing that. We're just encouraging, we want to see a fair representation of our denomination at Synod. That's right. Uh, we want to see faithful men who are there voting faithfully uh, on the issues at hand. And so that's all I'm encouraging. I, I just want to see, and I don't want it to be lopsided because we're afraid or intimidated to go. So my first thing for, for people is uh, put your name forward to go, especially deacons. I would encourage you um, put your name forward to go to synod. And, uh, and I'll, I'll, we'll make a commitment here as a messy reformation. We will do everything we can um, on this podcast to equip you, to support you, to do whatever we can to help you be successful at Synod. Uh, we've got plans to do, we did some videos last year helping out first-time delegates. Now I've been to Synod personally, so I've got some more thoughts on things. We'll be putting out some more podcasts and videos coming up, um, kind of helping people understand how Synod works. So we'll do anything we can to support you. So just step one is go. Um, and then step two, I would say, um, we need to we need to show up with a, a level of firmness. Um, I think I I'll just say based on the responses that have come from Grand Rapids East and from Neeland um, that I know of, anyways, that's public from the In Loco Committee. Um, they're not repenting. They're not plant. They have no desire to change course based on our rebuke from last year's synod. Neeland, like two weeks after synod, said. We're not doing anything about it. They said they're going to appeal, which isn't a thing. Um, and so, so they're not changing. Grand Rapids East has publicly come out and said, we're not going to do anything. The, the in loco committee has told us to discipline Neeland and we're not going to. And so I think we have to be prepared coming up to the Synod to, to remove them. To for sure remove Neeland. I don't know what happens with Grand Rapids East, but there are a lot of churches in Grand Rapids East that that have just publicly come out affirming. I think any church that has publicly come out as affirming needs to be given a period of time to, to repent and turn. 
Otherwise, they'll be removed as well. And we need to make some of these hard decisions um, as a denomination. Um, and we're not making them too quickly. It's not like we're doing this with a joy in our heart. Um, these things hurt. It is painful. It stinks. I, I don't want to have to kick churches out. I want them to repent and be faithful. Um, but they're refusing to. And so that means discipline comes in. And in order for us to be good shepherds of our denomination, we need to lead our church. We need to feed our church. We need to know our church. <laughs> we need to protect our church. And so I would encourage people to do that. I don't know how much, I know there's a lot of different um, overtures being written out there right now, preparing for sin. And a lot of people have different ideas on overtures. If you have an idea, I'd write an overture. You can even send an overture on to us and we'll give you our thoughts and feedback on that. We can help you kind of think through an overture if you want to do that. But, but in all honesty, I don't think we need much for overtures coming up. Um, I just think we need to show up with, with a firmness. And a willing to just say, no, we are not backtracking on this. I, Grand Rapids East, I think publicly the banner said they have a, they have an overture coming saying they want us to change our pronouncement to this being an interpretation of a confession, not the interpretation of a confession. Mm -hmm. And I think we need people to stand up and say, no, this is the only way we've ever understood unchastity. This is the, this is the only way. And we're not going to understand unchastity in any other way. We just got to stand firm on these things leading forward. That's really the path toward reformation. I think, you know, we know that there's a lot of other things that need to happen. Um, there's a lot of just denominational bureaucracy that's a mess right now. And I'm saying, I don't think we even need to worry about that right now. Right now is our time to just stand firm. And then uh, after Synod 2023, when we stand firm, which I think we will, um, there's going to get, a, I think a lot of shuffling is going to happen in the denomination. Mm -hmm. There's already shuffling happened based on the last synod. I've, I know pastors who are leaving because they can't in good conscience remain in the CRC. And I, I give them a lot of credit for that. Uh, that's integrity to me. I think people who are trying to stay in the CRC who disagree with our position are, I'm sorry to say that. I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm just saying you're, it's lacking integrity to try to stay. Um, and so I appreciate the guy. I, I have a lot of respect for the men I know of who have left already. And, uh, and I will respect those who will leave on their own volition and not force us to have to kick them out. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, it's kind of like those issues. I have this with my kids every once in a while where, where they're being really disobedient and rebellious. And I come up to them and I say, please stop doing this. If you continue to do this, I will discipline you and you're not going to like it. And I don't really want to discipline you, but if you keep doing it, I will discipline you. So please stop because I don't want to have to do this. And, and that's kind of what we're saying to these churches and these pastors saying, Hey, here's where we're at as a denomination. We're not going to change on this. So please repent of what you're, of what we are calling false teaching or leave and go somewhere else, but don't make us kick you out. Like, that's not what we want. Nobody wants to do that. Don't make us kick you out. Just mm -hmm. show integrity and leave. Um, and then go serve somewhere where you can serve in a good conscience. And then where we can be in a denomination where we can serve in a good conscience. Because right now it's just all mess and tension. And nobody's really enjoying being part of the CRC right now. <laughs> and so let's let's get this cleared up. So that we can enjoy being part of the CRC and you can go enjoy being part of whatever denomination you go to and we can both serve in good conscience on true mission and with the true unity and with a true understanding of what our baptismal identity actually is. Yeah, and in tandem with those things, I would say for anybody who is synod bound, uh, I would say understand that you are going to head into conflict. You will be engaging with those with whom you disagree. But understand that these disagreements do not equate with unlovingness toward one another. But understand that the goal here is exactly what you said. It is to be bold and clear on how God has spoken and understanding we can't exist together. And also, I would say, as you engage with those who you would 
disagree with. Do that with integrity too. Uh, just be very honest and say, am I hearing you right when you said this? And force them to be honest about you too. And say, well, that's really not actually my position. It is this. Um, I think that is the best way to accurately represent all parties who are involved here. Understanding that we're probably still going to come out on opposite sides of the fence. And that's okay. That's what happened in 2022. I would expect that to happen in 2023 as well. But we need to understand that these things need to happen. These conversations need to happen. We need to be firm and clear about how God has spoken and how we ought to speak now about how it is incumbent upon us as ambassadors of the gospel of Jesus Christ to declare that gospel proudly and boldly for the sake of God's church and for his name and for his glory. That's all we have for this week. Stay tuned next week to hear our conversation with Curtis Melifsta. But until then, don't forget this is Christ's church, and he bought it with his blood. And we've been warned that wolves will come in trying to destroy the flock. So keep a close watch on your life and on your doctrine. Preach the word in season and out of season. And keep fighting the good fight in this messy reformation.